merch. I, I like that. Uh, he doesn't have that. I like rats. Not, 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 he's growing. He's growing. He's, he's, you got to stop. I didn't say it. I know what you're doing. I didn't say anything. You know exactly what you're talking about. You know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, I tried it. If you're saying that, you know what? What? All right. So I know I promised last time that we would continue with the metrology lecture and we will do that, but I wanna start off with today's lecture topic and then we'll get back to finishing up the metrology lecture. Today I wanna to talk about CNC machining and prototyping because that's kind of what we're gonna do in the class, right? And we talked about the fact that we use CNC machining as our example manufacturing process in this class primarily because it's the thing that we're good at here at WPI. We have access to a lot of CNC machine tools. And th there was actually another reason. It's, uh, it's that the WPI students, when they come back to the lab to work on their MQP, tend to want to be able to use the equipment in the lab. So we're trying to save ourselves a little bit of effort later when you come back by having you have a little bit of knowledge now. Uh, so who's either a freshman or a sophomore? Most of us, right? So it's a few years before you're gonna do your MQP. Don't worry, you will forget everything unless you're one of the people that comes back to the lab all the time and does work, which, which definitely happens. But my experience shows that when you do come back, you'll remember that things were possible and you'll remember that there was an instruction set for doing something and you'll either find that or you'll very quickly pick it back up again when you get back. It's sort of like riding a bike, I guess. Um, anyways, so there's a lot of different CNC machining processes and things like that that we can talk about in the class, but let's focus on, on what is a prototype and why we want to do prototype manufacturing before we get too far into that. So what is the prototype and why do we do it? Yep. A test of the product. I actually like that. It's and it could be any number of things that we're testing, but it's sort of a First attempt. Does anybody have anything they want to add to what is a prototype? Yeah. Kind of like a rough draft of the thing that you want to make. So, and it's this rough draft because we want to test things about it. Um, sometimes you want to test, is this the shape that would be pleasing to the customer? Uh, are we, I worked for a, a company that uh, they made um, CPAP devices. It was like a CPAP. It was different, slightly like that. But these are uh, so people that snore really loud and a lot. It's because their their breathing passages close when they fall asleep, and uh, and so if this happens, you actually stop getting oxygen to the brain, and then your brain freaks out. And you wake up and you go, <gasps> and then you breathe again for a little while. And then it, and it, it happens again. So it's really bad medical condition. It makes it so people actually don't sleep at night, even though they're sleeping. The way they diagnose it, actually, it's kind of cool. They ask you, do you often fall asleep while driving? <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the questions. There's other more sophisticated things. But they don't run the other tests unless you say you often fall asleep while driving. Um, there's a few other questions. I suppose you could say no to that one and still get the, still get to have the test. Uh, anyways, so we, we built the machine. And what they did is you, you put a little mask over your mouth and nose. And it provides a positive pressure. It forces the airways open. And it keeps you breathing all night long. So you don't have these episodes where you wake up in the middle of the night. Um, our, our device was actually special because it only applied the positive pressure when you were inhaling. So it like let you exhale, not against the pressure. That was what, that was the the thing about our device. It was cool, 
but people had to buy these, right? It was, it, it could literally extend your life. Not sleeping well will cause you to die younger. So it can literally extend your life, but you still got to convince people to buy them. And so we did some prototyping of the shape of the box that it was going to sit in. And we went to a, to a company that did rapid prototyping. Who's heard the term rapid prototyping before? Right? And so this was back in the 1990s. Yeah, late 90s, late 1990s. We're, we're going to this place that does rapid prototyping. And so they made us like a shoebox out of this really like delicate, brittle plastic. And I mean, you had to like, like don't sneeze too close to it. Uh, Cause you might break it. Uh, but it had all the cool shape and everything that we were going to Eventually the, the case was going to be injection molded, but you don't pay for the molds for the injection molding before you know, that's the shape you want. So we had two questions. Was it cool looking enough that people would buy it? And could we fit all the stuff that had to make the device work inside the box? Right? So we spent, I think each iteration was $30,000 in that range. Maybe, maybe the total of three iterations, maybe it was only 10,000 each. Um, it was since the place was sort of on the way home for me, it was my job to stop and pick them up on my way home or on my way to work and then bring them back to the office. Uh, that was also probably my job because I was the youngest engineer that worked at the facility. Uh, it was one of the first jobs I had out of college. So, but if I wanted to 3D print a box today, would it cost $30,000? Not unless I was printing it out of unobtainium, right? Right, so <laughs> it, it really does depend on the material. But the, the point was the state of the art material back in the late 90s was this, this um, S, uh, I forget which it was, it was like SLA. But anyway, that was the state of the art. Only a few places in the world did it, not just like a few places in Massachusetts or New Hampshire did it, a few places in the world did it. But it was a process that we'd been using since the 1980s. So it's not like it wasn't a well-known process. So uh, fast forward a few years, a couple decades, maybe a decade. I was in the WPI manufacturing labs. We loved it when tour groups came in. When who, who did a, none of you probably did a tour that went through the manufacturing labs when you were applying one or two. It used to be if I'd asked that question in ME1800, all the hands would go up because it was a prominent thing on the tour, but you all came to WPI when there were no tours, huh? or the tours were extremely limited, that sucks. Um, anyways, talking to a, a kid's parent, because uh, it's always the parents have the most questions on these tours. And he says, do you guys do rapid prototyping at WPI? And so I knew what he meant. He meant 3D printing. And I said, well, see that machine right there? I think half inch deep, half inch over, 800 inches a minute in aluminum is pretty fast. Um, but prototyping is, we want to test something specific. So the part that we're prototyping doesn't have to be exactly the same as the part we're going to bring to production, right? So my example of our $30,000 box, we, we needed to know, will our stuff fit into it? And will it look good enough that our focus group consumers say that they would buy it? That was, that was what we were testing. So we weren't testing if it was going to be durable. We weren't testing whether it was going to transmit the sound. We built other prototypes to talk about transmitting the sound. So you think about this, you have an air compressor on your nightstand. Who's ever heard an air compressor before? Yeah. So you got to do something to make them not that loud. Um, and so this is actually a, it was a very cool engineering challenge. Um, I don't know, they were getting ready for their IPO. They laid me off because they lost a production, or no, they lost a distribution contract on another product. So I don't, I don't even know how that product came out. Yeah. Uh, this, well, the pistons are used to compress the air, air gas mixture. Um, but yeah, there, there are other compressors inside autos sometimes. Um, anyways, all right. So we make prototypes to test specific things. Prototype does not have to be made the way the thing will be made in production. 
Who's, who's ever had coffee from a Keurig? Yep, most of us have had coffee from a Keurig. How much do the little Keurig cups cost on average to make one cup of coffee? Uh, I, I mean, with the coffee and everything in it. Uh, I, th I think you're buying some cheap coffee. I, I think the cost between like 50 cents and two bucks, depending on which brand you're buying. So almost as much as going down to Starbucks or whatever. Yep. See, I was just guessing. I think you can, I think you could buy more expensive ones. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The little yeah, Keurig is the brand. Oh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's Keurig. I don't think I'm into Keurig, but I do drink coffee. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of different brands of people that do it, but but it was actually Vermont Coffee Roasters that invented the the process, this Keurig process, and they spun off Keurig as a separate corporation. Um, and at any rate, the first batch of the little coffee cups that they made to go in their machines, and and so what they wanted to do, they basically give the, give you the machine away because then you're hooked buying the coffee from them. I heard the first batch of cups cost 50 bucks each to make. So they were spending a lot of money on those prototype cups. They hadn't optimized the process yet, but they had to prove that the market was viable, right? And so they did a big production run at a very expensive cost to prototype the fact that they could sell the items, right? Then they could worry about getting the production cost down. So obviously if they sell them for 50 cents now, they don't cost 50 bucks to make anymore. Um, so prototyping can do a lot of different things when we do. So who's 3d printed a part or had one 3d printed for them? Pretty much everybody in the room. Me too. All right. So why did you pick 3d printing? Yeah. Cheap, fast, and easy to use. Anybody else pick 3d printing for a different reason? So there are some shapes that you can make with 3D printing that are virtually impossible to make with traditional machining processes or, or impossible. Go ahead. The coolness factor. Yeah, so, so I actually have this cool 3D printed um, uh, beverage um, un uncloser, beverage uncloser, right? Bottle opener. And uh, we, we actually have a, uh, a lab exercise that we use sometimes in the lab where we make these aluminum bottle openers. They're pretty cool, but they're pretty simple. And, uh, and I traded one of those for this cool titanium 3D printed um, bottle opener. You can see it's got all these intricate shapes and everything like that. And so I thought this was a good example and maybe... All right, if you promise not to open any bottles in here, because I think there's a sign that says no food or drink. Um, and, uh, and if you promise to get it back to me, I'll pass this around. But uh, I took it to be an example of a shape that was really well suited to 3D printing because it was a shape that I couldn't see how to make. And I was really proud of it. I brought it home. I showed my wife. I said, look at this cool 3D printed titanium thing I got. And she looked at it and says, well, how many do you want? What material do you want them out of? She says, I could cast those all day long. But if you only wanted one, 3D printing was totally the process to make it. Because if you're going to cast it, then you got, well, that she was going to investment cast it, which means she's going to make the investment probably by 3D printing, then embed it in some sand or some stuff, and then pour the metal in, take them out. Um, so anyway, we often say that 3D printing is because you can't make that other shape. And that's a good reason to use that 3D printing technology. Who said it was fast? So what's fast about it? There's almost no setup work, right? Yeah. I would argue that with some 3D printers, you do need to check that stuff, but yeah. It's one piece. It's, what, what about so it's like, one piece? You could, sometimes it, it might be faster. Instead of making multiple parts, you can make it all in 
Oh, okay. So something that if you were going to use traditional machining processes, it would have to be an assembly of parts. You could print as one bulk item with a 3D printer because of that. Yeah. Oh, because you can make it in your dorm room or your, your apartment or wherever you happen to have that 3D printer. Because, I mean, what is, what is the range of cost on 3D printers today? $29 and up, right? I've, I've, seen, them, I've seen them on uh, Alibaba for 29 bucks. Up in the back. Yeah, with, with, with certain types of printers, the time to actually make the product is fast. Yep. Oh, uh, so, so it's... So, like, if they've got glass around them, it's hard to break the glass? Right, right. So, like we're saying, if we're doing our CNC machining, and that would actually be a good segue for the next slide. Yes. If we're doing our CNC machining... Uh, when we're, we're doing this, so this is, a, this is actually a model that we're going to get to know very well next week. But um, when, when we look at this, if you see the, the green part is, is the cutting tool, red part is the chip, the blue part there is the workpiece. So as that edge of the cutting tool moves through the workpiece, it turns workpiece into chip. And you've all seen this inside a machine tool now, right? You've seen the, the tool go through the workpiece, make the chips fly off. Sometimes if you don't have the correct fixturing, make the part fly off, right? That was what you were talking about? Yeah. And, uh, and so what happens is right at this interface between the chip and the workpiece and the cutting tool, there could be thousands of pounds of thrust happening. You have thousands of pounds applied to the workpiece when it's not fixtured very well, it flies across the, uh, the machine. Whereas the forces involved in 3D printing tend to be pretty low. The temperatures can be pretty high, depending on the type of printing, right? We're doing like the laser center. So the, the, the part I'm passing around, uh, the, it was a laser centering process. So a powder bed laser centered part. And so, so the way this works is you put the titanium powder in there, and then you take a, a high-powered laser and you fuse it together at the spot where you want that layer. So we've all seen the traditional the plastic FTM printers where they, they raster around like this and they build up layers of stuff. So this laser sintering works the same way, except they're building up layers of powder and sintering it, puts more powder, center it, puts more powder, center it. Same idea, same, same sort of the way a, a resin printer works where you've got the resin there and the way that it cures is by a certain wavelength of light hitting it typically. And so you focus that light in different places and the part just grows in the resin. So there tends to be low forces in the 3D printing. Um, and it tends to be, tends to be, I'm going to say tends to be, there tend to be high forces in the CNC machining. And the reason for those, and the reason I say tends to be is we like to make the parts as fast as we can. In order to go faster, we have to put more force on the part. We could go slower, reduce the cutting force, and have it be less likely to, to throw the part across the machine. Um, yeah. So, does it, so you were in the class where that happened? Were you the one running the machine? Yeah. Describe to the class what happened in case everybody else didn't didn't hear it. Here, uh, I'll give you the microphone. Okay. So, for the people that, that weren't there. So this was the, the Y block on the second operation. And so it's the first part has already been cut. You flip the part over and you put it in the fixture and then you clamp it in the vise again. Go ahead. So the second that the tool touched the part, it shot back towards me. Do you know how fast the spindle was spinning? 8,300 RPM. Holy monster. Yeah, but the spindle was spinning at 8,300 RPM. 
Um, and do you know how fast it was feeding sideways? I'm going to guess it was 90 inches a minute. But I, I that, that's the typical speed we use for that tool in aluminum. So I haven't looked at the program. It could have been a little bit more. Um, so the problem was not your lack of arm strength. That may have been what somebody told you at the moment. The, does, do you know what the problem was? Turns out, so you were clamping on the part like this, right? But you'd already done the first operation. And the first operation puts a chamfer on the bottom of the part or on what was the top, which now becomes the bottom. And so what we had here was your part with the chamfer on it that was, I'm exaggerating that chamfer. So you've got this surface area and it was on the parallel. So the parallel is the thing that gets it so it's not sitting on the bottom of the vice jaws or the bottom of the vice and that keeps it from, uh, it, well, it keeps it so that it's level and everything in the machine. So it's sitting on the parallel. And then the top edge of the vice jaw was right here. So you actually were only clamping on that much material. And the parallels you were supposed to use, well, not, I mean, the parallels the person who set the machine up was supposed to use were down here like this. And you would have been clamping on that much material, which seems like it's only, it, it was actually an eighth of an inch difference. Seems like it's not that much, but also we're applying the force two inches above this, right? And so not only are we reducing the clamping area, we're applying the force pretty far away. And so there's a big lever arm that really wanted to cantilever that part up out of the fixture. Um, so that was the root cause of your problem. But nobody told me about it until the next day. And I said, when they told me, well, we threw three parts yesterday. I said, well, why did we throw the second one? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, it's because it was the wrong parallels. And we went and looked and it was the wrong parallels. They said, no, we use the tallest ones. I said, no, we don't use the tallest ones. But in my defense, I quickly diagnosed this because it, ain't the first time it's happened. So, I, and usually if I see you in the lab and you're struggling with something and I say, this is what you do to fix it, it's because I've made that mistake before. So, um, all right, so cutting forces can be big. Our CNC machining, but, but, what's the problem with a lot of 3D printed prototypes? The, uh, the strength of 3D, print, 3D printed parts almost always is very anisotropic. They're much stronger in one direction than they are in another direction. So that is, that is a problem with 3D printed parts. What, what's another problem with 3D printed parts for prototyping or for parts? Uh, tolerance and like warping. So when you want parts to assemble or like slide into each other, right. they don't create mounts for that. So the precision in your ability to hold specific shapes and tolerances is not as good with the 3D printed parts as it is with the CNC machine parts. In fact, even in, so it's not just prototypes that get made with 3D printing these days, right? We, we 3D print production parts that actually go out into service. We, we I talk about uh, the Airbus handles and stuff like that. And um, SpaceX prints parts of their, their engine assemblies and stuff like this. Uh, I know a lot of people that print parts for uh, injection molding where you, you need to control how fast you take the temperature out of those injection molded parts. And you want to put complex paths to put the cooling fluid through, usually water, to put the cooling fluid through the mold so that after you put the hot plastic in it, you can cool it down quickly and get the part out faster. And you can make more complex cooling paths with 3D printing the internal structures there. 
However, the high tolerance bits of all those parts, the things that actually make them function, are almost always finished machined. So these 3D printed finished parts almost always have a finished machining process that happens on them. Um, so that's another good reason to, to study CNC machining. But they're great at making a near net shape part. And they're, they, uh, the other thing is we use 3D printing a lot to make the molds for casting. Um, and so for investments for casting, things like that. So it's prototyping. We do prototyping in order to test something. We could be testing all different kinds of things. We could make all different types of prototypes to test different things. Um, what's, what's the cheapest way to prototype something? You could sculpt it. Maybe. I'm, not, I'm, I'm willing to put that in a category of, it depends how good you are at sculpting. If you're good at sculpting, your time that's spent sculpting is worth a lot of money. I'm not certain that's, that's the cheapest way, especially if you're going to do lots of iterations. Printer, paper, and tape. Uh, we used to use um, manila folders and thumbtacks a lot and tape and super glue, things like that. Yep. I think even cheaper and faster to iterate. <laughs> Plagiarism. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what else? Somebody else had a hand up. Yep. Pencil and a bar napkin, although in my experience, ballpoint pens work better on bar napkins. Um, but it's that's more of a sketch than a prototype typically. So the prototype, you're using it to test something, and I don't know that you could test something with that. Yeah. Online modeling, yeah. So, so using software, right? So with, with the solid... with. The power of solid modeling software that's available to us today, even stuff that you can run on your phone or in a, in a web browser, it's very easy to see, are things going to fit together? Are these things going to overlap with each other and fit together? It doesn't get you the touchy-feely kind of prototyping. And has anybody ever used like the strength analysis? And you guys use SolidWorks and stuff, right? So, so you do this finite element analysis of the strength um, when you load the parts. Do you know anything when you're done with that? Mm, maybe. So all those models are only as good as the assumptions you made when you, when you put in the forces and stuff like that. You have an idea, but if you actually want to know, so if you have two similar designs, and you're looking at where's the stress concentrations between these two similar designs, then you know a lot about that. You can see where the stresses are going to be concentrated, where that's going to happen. Until you actually break the thing and compare the actual results with the simulated results, you can't really calibrate it. So it would give you some information, but you don't know the answer. And a great example of that, we were doing a um, summer camp, and we were bringing in seventh and eighth graders, I think, to do this summer camp. And we're teaching them about technology. And really, it's, they're all put on by marketing. So it's really about getting them to apply to come to school here later when they grow up. But uh, but we're excited about the fact that we get to hang out with these kids and teach them about technology. And who's ever like made a like a soda bottle, filled it with water and high pressure air and shot it into the sky? Yeah. So we, that part of our part of our week was doing that. But what we were doing is we were actually having them machine launchers that they could take home with them so they could continue to terrorize the neighborhoods with their soda bottles. Um, and uh, the part of the mechanism was laser cut out of acrylic. The reason it was laser cut out of acrylic is because that's cheap and easy to do here. Um, <laughs> and I, I wish I'll, I'll see if I can find this video and I'll share it with you online. But um, there's a great video. Now, I was the camera person, and I was getting a shot of it uh, just about to launch. So here I am with the 
I was probably using my phone as a camera. I don't know. Here I am. And instead of launching the, uh, it exploded all over me and the camera and it's pretty exciting. And so, uh, and so it was from a fatigue crack and in the video, I slowed it down, uh, but from a fatigue crack. So the, the shape, so it's sort of like this, and this laser cut thing, and there's a pivot here. And so this would pivot off the, the thing that let the soda bottle go. And, um, you can actually watch the crack go across here in my video. Turns out after it happened the first time we did it with slow-mo because <laughs> that was fun, um, but didn't keep our face right next to it when we were doing it with slow-mo. Um, and so somebody redesigned it and he used the FEM software. So we still needed sort of this shape. We needed this we needed sort of a sharp corner here. I don't know if we needed a sharp corner there or not, but they continued to design it, but they beefed it up like this, made it stronger. See, makes sense, right? Yeah. He ran his finite element analysis in his SOLIDWORKS and says, yep, this one's not gonna break. Yep, no, that one broke after four launches also. So what needed to happen was have this not be a sharp corner and you could do that like this, right? So there's different ways you can, you can do those things. But anyway, so that was a prototype for us when we were getting ready to do this because we just, we knew we wanted to have these launchers. By the time we were making the ones that the kids were using, they didn't fail on the fourth launch. We also put pressure blow off valves in the system so that they couldn't pressurize them over 60 PSI. But at 120 PSI, you could shoot the length of the football field. This is back before the garage was there. It used to be a baseball field. Land halfway through the baseball field. 120 PSI. Don't do this at home. Um, not that particular one, but it's a big, it's a thing. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about CNC machining and that process. So um, material removal process, we call this large chip formation. So you've seen the chips, right? When you first saw one of those chips, you say, oh, that's a big chip. Because we call it large chip formation. But, but they looked small to you when you first saw them, right? Yeah, so small chips are like the ones you make with sandpaper. So that's material removal with small chip formation. So CNC machining typically does large chip formation, except for when it's CNC grinding or sanding, in which case it's small chip formation. But this is what we're gonna look at. And whether it's large chips or small chips, the physical mechanism is the same. It, it does the same thing. It's just when you're doing like sanding, you've got hundreds or thousands of cutting edges right next to each other. And when you're doing machining, well, like in a turning operation, you've got one cutting edge. And in a milling operation, it's three or four, maybe five, six, maybe. It could be, could be more than that as the tool gets bigger, but you have uh, many fewer cutting edges. Um, here is a example of a turning process. Let's go. All right, so in this process, they're facing off the front of the part. Let's go, let's go, let's go face, face. Right, and so they're, they're making that chip there. And as we zoom in on the process, as that chip is forming on the edge of the tool, it's sliding up the edge of the tool. I'm gonna pause right here. All right. Um, yeah, it's so it's the chip sliding up the edge of the tool. So you can see in the grains of the material here that they're kind of lined up and they're sort of amorphous in the workpiece material as it goes by. And they're all smushed together and jammed up. And so this, this here is the tool, the chip sliding on the edge of that tool, that face of the tool that this chip slides on, that's actually called the rake face of the tool. 
This will be important next week. But anyway, that chip slides up that rake face of the tool and it removes the material to make the part that we want. Go ahead. So we recycle them. Uh, typical to to recycle them. So it's you know, a little bit before that. All right. Play. Let's go. Oh, a little bit before that. Close enough. All right. So um, as we look at it, we have the chip. We have the workpiece. All I did was rotate this around because when we draw this, we tend to draw it in the other orientation. <coughs> so we have the uncut chip thickness, the chip, the tool as it goes through here. So this is the fundamental physical process of all machining is the, the work, the tool going through the workpiece like this. In the class, we're going to look specifically at turning. And so turning again is when the workpiece rotates and the tool moves sideways through the workpiece. So same operation we just looked at without quite the same magnification. You see the chip forming up on there. And then with, so with turning, you're gonna make shapes that are axisymmetric, right? The turning you're going to make shapes that are axisymmetric. The things that you can make with a revolve process in your CAM so or your CAD software, and with milling, you're going to make prismatic shapes. Um, long stringy chips. Yeah, I mean, that's what it's called. Yep. Yeah. So they go. We recycle them. We make, I don't know, I know a guy that makes $50,000 a year recycling the chips from his processes. So these are the kind of shapes that you can make with CNC machining. Now, when we're looking at this in prototyping, with the CNC machined part, you can get the same strengths and the same material properties that you're going to have in the production part. With the 3D printed part, especially if you're 3D printing in plastic for something that's going to be a metal part later, you won't get the same material properties. The 3D printed stuff is very um, anisotropic. Sorry. Yeah, very, very directional in its strength. So some examples of machining. So when we're doing our programming for our machining, we do this simulation step, right? You've all, you've all had a chance to do that now in lab, right? And so that purpose of the simulation step is to tell us in advance if the machine tool is gonna crash. Does that sound fair? Cheaper to crash in software than it is to crash in the machine, especially because you're unlikely to break the monitor when the part flies out of the fixture. In software. All right. All right, perfect. I want to get jump back. Any any questions on prototyping CNC machining? What it is, why why it's important, why CNC machining is different from 3D printing? Go. Yep. So the, um, the body of an iPhone is billet machined with a CNC machine. Um, actually, the, um, when the first iPhones were being made, there was a Worcester company that was bidding on the process of die casting the aluminum bodies for the iPhone. And they could not compete on price with Taiwanese company that got the contract to billet machine them. And, uh, and it's not like they were going to do the die casting in Worcester and obey all our rules. They had a facility in Malaysia they were going to use where they could violate all the environmental rules they wanted. So they were going to do it cheap in Malaysia 
they couldn't compete with CNC machining on price. Um, so very often, just because of, we, we know how to cut, especially materials like aluminum. Because of the aerospace industry, we really know how to cut aluminum. And we can cut aluminum really fast. In, in my estimation, the cutting tools that we design today for cutting aluminum are superior to the machines that tend to drive them. So you can't really, unless you're doing something stupid, you can't outperform the tool with the machine. The tool always outperforms the machine. With other materials, it's not the same, but with stuff like aluminum, yeah. So I would say that they're billet machining finished parts. They tend to be cast and finish machined. Yeah. Um, and it just, and a lot of times, and a lot of times it's about how much material do you have to remove to make the part. So if it's very often better to do a casting and then finish machine it or 3D print it and then finish machine it. Um, the, other, the other issue with 3D printing finished parts today, if they're in high stress locations, you have to do a lot of materials testing on that particular process before you can certify the part isn't going to fail. We know a lot about how machined parts perform over long periods of time. Um, so I don't think you'll see a lot of 3D printed wing spars for, for, but it'll come, it'll happen. It's just about understanding it. I know people are working on 3D printing for, for propellers, for uh, boats, things like that. So it's, it's a thing. Um, and you can, in, so also how long do you think it takes to make one of these with 3D printing? Right, hour or two maybe. How long would it take to cast one? A few seconds, minutes. I mean, cooling it, you have to let it cool a little bit. So, but it's in the range of minutes. So, if you're going to do volume production of something like this, you want to use a process like casting. Yeah. Um, so this would be an investment casting, and so so yes. But they'll either 3D print something like wax and put it in, this would be in sand or something like that. Yep. It's, it's faster because you do a whole bunch at once. Whereas one 3D printer only does one at a time. And so the way you get the economies is you do more than one at a time. Um, but yeah, it's... And, and 3D printing is very good at making the investments for things like this too, uh, where you can do a, so 3D printing metal takes longer than 3D printing wax, for example. Um, all right, so I wanna jump back. We've got a few minutes left. I wanna jump back to the surface metrology stuff that we ended on. Last week. Unfortunately, we won't watch the video again. All right, so we ended on what's a surface. And so surfaces are really important to us for a couple of reasons. One is because they tell us a story about how the, how the part was made. So if you, you can actually examine a surface and infer things about the way it was produced, even if you weren't there when it was made. Uh, we did a we did a study several years ago. Where we we're actually looking at fossilized teeth from our ancestors to try to understand what they were eating, so that we could. Un I, th I think a lot of the stupid paleo diet stuff came out of this study, actually. Um, but it was trying to understand what were our ancestors or what did ancient animals eat. Um, the way we did it was actually look at. Uh, like apes and monitor what they were eating. Um, hypnotize them with a tranquilizer, get a replica of their teeth, and then compare what the ape's teeth look like with the ancient teeth. And if the scratches and marks look the same, we inferred that they were eating the same kind of stuff. So you can, you can understand how things were made. I mean, the, the I guess the, um, the example everybody knows is from, from TV police shows, right? When they, they fire the gun and they, they take the bullet and then they match it, 100% match with the, the murderer's weapon, right? So this kind of thing happens. And so 
that firing of the gun, it actually does machining on the, the shell casing and on the bullet when it happens. And so you can see if those tool marks are the same in both places. Um, so you can use it to understand how things were made. But really, what we want to use it for in manufacturing is to understand how things are going to perform. So almost every manufactured thing that we make involves two surfaces that interact with each other. Right? In this case here, we have some geometry, but my surface has to interact with the cap on the bottle to open it up. Right? So it's only useful when the surfaces interact. Same thing with your, uh, your car tires. They're only useful when they're interacting with the asphalt on the road, right? I suppose they also have to interact with the hubs on the car, right? The rims on the car, which have to interact with the hubs. But all manufactured things are about surfaces that interact with each other. And so understanding how they're going to interact is, is a big thing. And we use it to control manufacturing processes. So the... Um, the uh, the fatigue crack example that I gave earlier. So fatigue loading is a big thing for airplanes. Because if you've ever flown an airplane and you've looked out the window at the wings, they're doing this, yeah. right? They're doing this a lot and they're vibrating a lot. And it's that kind of motion that causes those fatigue cracks to grow. And so you need to really understand how this material handles fatigue loading to know whether or not cracks are going to initiate and then spread across the thing and the wing falls off. It's bad when the wings fall off. Yep. Yeah, I remember on the last flight, it actually happened on the last flight, I actually saw a certain takeoff and something that the wings were pulling something to the wind. Oh, they move a lot. I mean, yeah. buildings too. Buildings do this in the wind, right? Yeah. So, um, so understanding that, so in... Um, Fatigue, little cracks, so little V-shaped indents are bad for fatigue. It's that sharpness of the point. Little V-shaped spikes, not so bad for fatigue. That won't cause a fatigue crack. This will cause a fatigue crack. And so the machining process that they were using tends to leave little bumps. And the only way they know to not have fatigue is to make sure there's no little features that are bigger or smaller than a certain size, bigger than a certain size, right? As long as the features are small enough, that won't start to crack. And so in order to do that, they have to make sure all the little bumps go away. So they want the surface to be very smooth. And the problem was it's because of the way they were measuring the surface that they need to have all those bumps go away because the bumps were not going to cause these fatigue cracks. And um, so anyway, so measuring the right things. All right, so peak to valley roughness, the highest high point to the lowest low point. Peak to valley in the sample that you measured. On a turned surface, so a part that we made with a lathe, you can actually calculate what it should be. And it's going to depend on the feed rate so how fast the tool's moving sideways through the workpiece and the radius of the tip of the tool. Because if you think about it, when you, when you draw this, so we've got, we've got our workpiece, we've got our tool here. This tool's got a little radius down on the tip here little r, it's feeding in that direction like that. And as it moves over for every rotation of the workpiece, it leaves a little shape of the tip of the tool, right? So to make those smaller, you could feed slower and they'd be closer together. So they'd be smaller. Um, or you could have a bigger radius on your tool, right? So you can calculate certain parameters. The, um, and so here's an example of measuring a turn surface. And you'll notice it's not just these little shapes, right? It's got some wave that goes into it, and it's got some finer scale little roughness on it. And so there's, there's really 
hundreds of different parameters that you can calculate from the measured surface. The ones that people tend to calculate are the average roughness. And so if you take that wavy line that we measured, if you set the mean value equal to zero and you level it, so if it's, if it's going uphill, you just rotate it with math, set that mean line equal to zero, it's the average distance of all the points from that center line. Or you could do the RMS difference. So RA is the most common surface roughness parameter you'll encounter. When you specify surface roughness on a drawing, you have to specify what parameter you're measuring. But in the US, it's almost always RA. Um, and here's the thing I was getting to about the fatigue. So these three surfaces could have the same RA value, the idealized surfaces, right? But they will behave differently in different situations. This one would probably be pretty good for traction, for walking on. This one would probably be pretty good for like oil retention for in a cylinder wall, like when the cylinder's going past or when the piston's going past um, to hold the oil in. But this one would be pretty bad for fatigue. Um, this one, I don't know. I certainly wouldn't be good for like a seat on a chair or something. It would hurt, right? To sit on the spike. Um, so anyway, so a bunch of different roughness parameters. RA is the most common. Um, and I will leave you with this thought that you cannot ever actually measure the surface of a part. You can only measure the interaction of your sensor with the part. And so the radius on this stylus that went across this part was five micrometers, five micrometer radius diamond on the bottom of that stylus. And this is 7075 aluminum, so fairly high strength aluminum. And the surface measurement. Could you try again? Okay, I'll try again later. <laughs> See? Hey Siri, go to sleep. I can't sleep, but I enjoy a good bedtime story. <laughs> Siri, tell us a bedtime story. Shut, shut her right up, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know why she does that. Always on the watch too. But I wasn't talking to her. You said something not remotely close to Hey Siri. Sorry.